official political pronouncements of the founding fathers of this nation. So these uh, pronouncements were issued during the eight turbulent years of the Revolutionary War, and they were issued to the entire nation, and for all practical purposes, they are sermons, many sermons that are riddled with scripture and biblical spiritual principles. I pointed out to you that these politicians obviously saw as part of their function and their role to urge the nation to look to Jesus Christ and to the God of the Bible in order for our nation to be able to accomplish what it has accomplished. So the, uh, the notion of separation of church and state, they had very definite views about that. That is, religion is not to be forced on anybody. But they did not mean by that that you strip Christianity out of public life. They said that would be national suicide and you cannot have the backing of God with that kind of thinking. So they openly acknowledged God. Now notice by mentioning God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit in these official pronouncements, there may have been a handful of people in, in the country that would have been offended by that. There were some atheists, not very many, and there were some Muslims that had come over as workers. But notice the founders did not see the need to alter the government, the school, our civic institutions, and public life in order to avoid offending people that don't agree with the Christian worldview. Well, they were right about that. If you can successfully turn a country into an arena in which anything and everything is tolerated and embraced and celebrated, that will be a nation that will soon be gone from the face of the earth. You have to look to the God of the Bible. So moving to 1778, look at this proclamation. It having pleased Almighty God through the course of the present year to bestow great and manifold mercies on the people of these United States, and it being the indispensable duty of all men gratefully to acknowledge their obligations to him for benefits received. Resolve that it, uh, that it be and hereby is recommended to the legislative or executive authority of each of the said states to appoint Wednesday the 30th day of December next to be observed as a day of public thanksgiving and praise. That all the people may with united hearts on that day express a just sense of his unmerited favors, particularly in that it, it hath pleased him by his overruling providence to support us in a just and necessary war for the defense of our rights and liberties, by affording us seasonable supplies for our armies, disposing the heart of a powerful monarch to enter into alliance with us and aid our cause, that was France, by defeating the counsels and evil designs of our enemies and giving us victory over their troops, and by the continuance of that union among these states, which by his blessing will be their future strength and glory. There has to be union unity among the American people. We're more divided than ever before. It's further recommended that together with devout thanksgivings may be joined a penitent confession of our sins and humble supplication for pardon through the merits of our Savior. The founders of our country had no hesitation to explicitly refer to Jesus Christ in their official political national utterances. So that under the smiles of heaven, if America ever needed the smiles, the favor of heaven, it is now. Independ um, and our public councils may be directed, our arms by land and sea prospered, our liberty and independence secured, our schools of, and seminaries of learning flourish, our trade be revived, our husbandry and manufactures increased, and the hearts of all impressed with undissembled, that is, non-hypocritical piety, with benevolence, and zeal for the public good and avoid recreations on that day. Moving to 1779. I'm going to hurry through this one just to show you how much they allude to the Bible. And here is that, that concept that they again express where when you as a nation are going through national turbulence, national suffering, one very real biblical explanation for that is we are being punished for our sins. And they said, you know, despite that, in just punishment of our manifold transgression. Were you taught that in public school? 
One of the reasons why the Revolutionary War had to occur was to punish the people for their sins. It hath pleased the supreme disposer of all events to visit these United States with a calamitous war. And yet, even in the midst of that, through which, well, I'll come back to that in just a moment. Let me show you this uh, document that was uh, a sermon preached in 1773, back uh, leading up to the founding of our country, when they had an election day like we're about to have. They would invite a preacher in to the Capitol Legislative Hall with all of the individual city, the, the past politicians, the ones that were about to be elected, and he'd just preach a sermon to them. And they loved it. It was part of their life. They understood that that's, that's the approach we ought to take in life. And here was Charles Turner back in 1773. Our adversity is to be considered as the effect of providential agency or permission. Now think about right now, if you think our nation's in the midst of turbulence and turmoil, you need to understand the providential agency or permission is a righteous parental chastisement of heaven for our many provocations and a loud call for universal repentance and reformation according to the gospel of Christ. You know, the Bible teaches that national tragedy can serve that purpose. You remember 911? We saw it with our own eyes. Right after 911, for about six minutes, our nation became religious. People put up God Bless America signs in their yards. Uh, I saw a number of the congressmen come out on the steps of the Capitol and they sang God Bless America. I was surprised that the steps didn't fracture and the whole place fall apart right there. So for a few minutes, our nation, a good percentage of them, became concerned and looked back to God. That's a good thing. What's it going to take for it to last longer and be more widespread? A loud call for universal repentance and reformation according to the gospel of Christ. Now notice, despite this calamitous war, through which his divine providence hath hitherto in a wonderful manner conducted us. He even blessed us in the midst of that. Now look at these, these allusions to scripture. The race is not to the swift, but the battle to the strong. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. Uh, taught to amend their lives and turn from their sins. The wording of Jeremiah in 2 Chronicles. That God might turn from his wrath, 2 Kings 23. The incredulity of Pharaoh, that's a reference to the Pharaoh of the Exodus. There's reason to fear that he may permit much of our land to become the prey of the spoiler, 2 Kings 21. Our borders to be ravaged, our habitations destroyed. How many Americans believe that this nation could very easily undergo such a situation that we would become the prey of the spoiler, our borders ravaged, and our habitations destroyed? But if you could pull all 300 million Americans, most all of them would say, nah, that can't happen. Too powerful, we got a great military. So another day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, that he will grant us his grace to repent of our sins and amend our lives according to his holy word. You know, our system of jurisprudence, our legal system was built on the Bible. Founders made no bones about that. The Bible was taught in public school regularly right up until about World War II. You know that courts now disallow the Bible? One jury, for example, up in Colorado, when a fellow was placed on death row by their um, deliberations, they then uh, went back in to deliberate the final sentencing and said he deserves the ca uh, capital punishment, the death penalty. And he sat on death row and for 10 years appealed his case and finally went to the highest court in Colorado, state Supreme Court, tipped to the left. And they commuted his death sentence that the people, you see, had placed upon him. Because, back there when they deliberated, one of the jurors brought a Bible into the jury deliberation room and read scriptures about capital punishment to the other jurors. So the high court said, can't have the Bible involved in our jurisprudence. That's astounding. That's where we got our system of jurisprudence. 
And all the people are called upon to amend their lives according to the Bible. Notice the father to the fatherless children. That's a reference to Psalm 68, verse 5. Patience in suffering, James chapter 5. Fortitude in adversity. These are biblical expressions. Proverbs 24, verse 10. That he will inspire us with humility, moderation, gratitude. That he'll bless the labors of the husbandman. Paul said that to Timothy. Uh, pour forth abundance that we may enjoy the fruits of the earth in due season. Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 4. Comfort to the afflicted. Psalm 119. Notice, extend the influence of true religion. That's Christianity. Give us that peace of mind that the world can't give us. Both Jesus and Paul made that statement. That he'll be our shield in the day of battle. Common expression in the Psalms. Our comforter in the hour of death, Psalm 23, our kind parent, merciful judge through time and through eternity. John Jay, there was the president of the Continental Congress at the time, who was appointed by George Washington to be our first U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice. They were so familiar with their Bibles that they laced their political utterances with God's word. Moving to October of that year, here is a lengthy description of the great wonders and blessings bestowed upon America from the time of their forefathers. That would be the pilgrims, right up to the founding era. And you can glance through these incredible things, allowing us to become a nation, spreading plenty throughout the land. But look down there at the very bottom, after listing all these tremendous things that the Continental Congress said we can thank God for. In bringing all of this about down through the last 150 years, here we are a nation. But you know what God has done for us above all? Above all the things that God's done for this country. He's diffused the glorious light of the gospel whereby through the merits of our gracious Redeemer we may become heirs of his eternal glory. There is the greatest blessing ever bestowed on the United States of America. According to the men that set it up. Is this the attitude of our politicians today? Notice that he, uh, they call upon all Americans to beg God to grant to his church the plentiful effusions of divine grace and pour out his Holy Spirit on all ministers of the gospel, that he would bless and prosper the means of education. And look at this statement. Spread the light of Christian knowledge through the remotest corners of the earth. I'm telling you there, I don't know of any politicians on any level of government that see that that purpose has anything to do with their role. They don't see it in any way remotely connected to what they're doing as a politician. Well, right or wrong, they're not the kind of people that set up our country. And then look here at the bottom. Finally, that God would establish the independence of these United States upon the basis of a strong economy, strong military, health care for every citizen. In fact, here are the kinds of things that we hear regularly uh, from our media people and no doubt from teachers. You know what? Why was this republic established? What's it based on? Well, you know, we're trying to get out from under British rule and, and create an environment where we can celebrate all religions or irreligion. You know, we celebrate atheists as much as we do Hindus. And we have a great environment here. And we, we want a government that will basically care for people from, from womb to tomb. Provide our education, our health care, give us a check every month. Oh yeah, there's a lot of Americans that believe that's really what our country's about. That's why our government exists. So unbelievably tragic. The founders begged God to establish the independence of these United States on the basis of religion and virtue. And I assure you they're talking about Christianity. America's freedom, America's independence, the founders envisioned to be established upon God and Christianity. Who were these men? 
as the war begins to wind down. It pleased the righteous governor of the world for the punishment of our manifold offenses to permit the sword of war still to harass our country. It becomes us to endeavor by humbling ourselves before him and turning from every evil way to avert his anger and obtain his favor and blessing. I wonder how many Americans it dawns upon that if things are not going well for a country, that they need to look inward and say, wow, I'd better straighten up and stop sinning so that God will bless our country again. It's a novel concept in our day, but prominent, of course, in the Bible and at the beginning of our nation. Look at this statement here. Asking God, well, making us sincerely penitent for our transgressions, prepare us for deliverance, remove the evils with which he'd been pleased to visit us, banish vice and irreligion from among us, establish virtue and piety by his divine grace. Unbelievable. Let's move to 1780, late in that year. Pleased Almighty God, notice, the Father of all mercies, amidst the vicissitudes and calamities of war, to bestow blessings on the people of these states, which call for their devout and thankful acknowledgments. More especially, in the late remarkable interposition of his watchful providence, in rescuing the person of our commander-in-chief and the army from imminent dangers at the moment when treason was ripened for execution. They're talking, of course, about Benedict Arnold, who, as the commandant of West Point, made a deal with the British to turn that facility over to the British and even had a plan that was kind of after the fact in which he realized hey, I can turn Washington over to you too, if everything goes just right. And incredibly, that plot was foiled, and Arnold slipped through their fingers and fled to England. Here was uh, Major General Nathaniel Green's assessment of that day, and this was the sentiments of the founders. Treason of the blackest dye was yesterday discovered. General Arnold, who commanded at West Point, lost to every sentiment of honor public and private obligation, was about to deliver us up that important post into the hands of the enemy. Such an event must have given the American cause a deadly wound, if not a fatal stab. Happily, the treason has been timely discovered to prevent the fatal misfortune. How'd that come about? How was that plot foiled? God did it. The providential train of circumstances which led to it affords the most convincing proof that the liberties of America are the object of divine protection. They said this is just another indication that God's going to grant us freedom and allow us a national existence. And the founders of our country issue a proclamation affirming that very thing. Astounding. Above all, He's continued to us the enjoyment of the gospel of peace, biblical expression for the gospel of Christ. We ought to confess our unworthiness of the least of his favors, to offer our fervent supplications to the God of all grace, that it may please him to pardon our heinous transgressions. And you know what Americans across our nation need? They need to have their hearts inclined for the future to keep all his laws. We desperately need that today. And look at the final statement here. To cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. Here they are in the midst, the throes of, of war, with their national survival in question. And after thanking God for rescuing our commander-in-chief, they then say, and we, we pray Christianity will spread over the whole planet. These men had their values and their thinking straight about such matters. We're now within two years of the close. In the hour of calamity, impending danger, let's jump down here to 
May we appease uh, by our manifold, bewail our manifold sins and transgressions by sincere repentance and amendment of life, appease his righteous displeasure, and through the merits of our blessed Savior obtain pardon and forgiveness. And then notice once again at the bottom that pure and undefiled religion, that's a direct reference to James 1.27, may universally prevail. 1781, it's pleased God once again remarkably to assist and support the United States of America in their important struggle for liberty. Look at the uh, last sentence of that first paragraph. Through the whole of the contest, from its first rise to this time, the influence of divine providence may be clearly perceived in many signal instances, and we're going to mention a few. In this proclamation to the people, he revealed the counsels of our enemies when the discoveries were seasonable and important, and the means seemingly inadequate or fortuitous in preserving and even improving the union. I won't read all of these, but that whole paragraph is saying, look what God's done for us. We, we are obligated to list some of the things that God did from the very beginning of the war right on down to now that is attributable only to God. And then he, they mention how after the success of our allies by sea, a general of the first rank with his whole army has been captured by the allied forces under the direction of of our commander-in-chief. This is a reference, of course, to the famous <laughs> British uh, Major General Lord Cornwallis, who uh, incredibly, I mean, it's an incredible story. Our young people need to be taught this because God's in it to every step of the way and turned over his 8,000 men in his army in the siege of Yorktown. He was so humiliated by, by this happening. I mean, he was the toast of England that on the day uh, in which the formal surrender occurs where the, uh, the victors line up on both sides, this is a famous painting, notice Americans on the right, French on the left, our allies, and the, uh, the conquered general is supposed to you know, come and take his sword and turn it over to uh, the victor. Well, he was so humiliated he feigned illness in his tent and turned the process over to his second. The founder said, God was with us again in that occurrence. It really spelt uh, the, the direction that the war was now going to go. And look at the very bottom of this one as well. That God might cause the knowledge of God to cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. That same sentiment is expressed in the next one, within a year of the close of the war, look at this statement right here. When the lust of dominion or lawless ambition excites arbitrary power to invade the rights or endeavor to wrest from a people their sacred and invaluable privileges and compel them in defense of the same to encounter all the horrors and calamities of a bloody and vindictive war, then is that people loudly called upon to fly under that God for protection who hears the cries of the distressed and will not turn a deaf ear to the supplications of the oppressed. I'm telling you, we're on the verge of that. America needs to fly to that God for protection. Christians certainly do. Notice once again emphasizing the holy laws of our God. And look at this statement. May God make us a holy so that we can be a happy people. Now, now wait a minute. If you ask Americans, ask your own children. Go home today and ask your own children. What, what will make you happy? I'll get it for you. Tell me what will make you happy. What do you think they're going to say? Let's go to Walmart. I'll show you, Mom, Dad, what will make me happy. And that's like adults, too. If we could pull all the adults. Come on, what would make you happy? Well... I've really been wanting that job or, or that position in that company or I could, I could use a new bass boat and, and just on and on. The, the list would be endless. We go to the Bible and we learn, God tells us, I created you. I created your spirit. That's who you are, your personality. I created all of your lawful appetites. And there's not anything on this planet physical that's going to make you happy. 
Now that's what God says to us. Well then what will make me happy and contented and, and fulfilled, satisfied? Live the Christian life. Obey God. Follow God. That's profound. And the founders articulated it. We want Americans to be a happy people. How do we accomplish that? Make us holy. Ardent followers of God and Jesus Christ. See, these are sermons. There's so much spiritual meat here. It's lacking, no doubt, from churches all over our nation. And then notice once again that the religion of our divine Redeemer with all its benign influences may cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. That expression, cover the earth as the what is in Isaiah and Habakkuk. Isn't that an incredible concept? We want Christianity to so thoroughly blanket the, the world that it, it's equivalent to the way water covers oceans. That's thorough. That's thorough. All right, within six months of the close of this thing, let me just call your attention to the bottom here. Testify their gratitude to God, people of all ranks, for his goodness by a cheerful obedience to his laws. And by his influence, all of us in our station, we should be promoting. You want to know what to do as Christians right now, given our national situation? All right. Promote each in his station and by his influence the practice of true and undefiled religion, which is the great foundation of public prosperity and national happiness. Now, we already saw that they said that about being happy. But look at that other statement. What is the foundation of public prosperity? Well, everybody knows that would be a multi-trillion dollar spending package. Or health care for all citizens. Or balance the national budget. Do you know that if we could get all of the brightest and best economists in our country from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, all over the nation, get them all into one big building and say, look, ladies and gentlemen, you are the best and brightest. You've studied economics as much, I suppose, as it can be studied. We, we're, in a, we're on the brink of national economic collapse. Most everybody agrees to that. We need all of you to give us your input so that we can fix this thing and save our nation's future economic calamity. Do you think any of them would say that? Do you think one of them would stand up and say, oh, I've got the answer that surpasses all others. We need to promote Christianity and try to get as many Americans back to God, Christ, and the Bible as possible. That's the solution to all of our economic woes. They would all look at that person and think, what a complete, who let this guy in here? This is what the Bible teaches. I'm telling you it teaches. It's that simple. There's not a lot of complexity here. This is not rocket science. You remember when God's people of Israel were about to enter into the promised land. They commenced their national existence in coming out of Egypt. They, they blew it and had to wander around for 40 years. And now Deuteronomy, they're about ready to go and take the land. What would you expect God to tell them? Because the book is about how to establish national existence and then secure it, perpetuate it. Here's how to go into the country, set up your national, your national existence, and then be successful. Here it is. If you'll diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God's going to set you high above all nations of the earth. You're going to surpass all the nations. The Lord will open to you as good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain. I wish we had time to look through this whole chapter. Go home and read it. He'll bless all the work of your hand. You know what else he's going to do for you? You're going to be lending to other countries. But you're not going to have to borrow from them. And then when you go further down in the chapter, if it shall come to pass, you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments and his statutes that I command you. All these curses will come upon you. I wish we had time to look at the Hebrew terms listed thereafter that are translated in our English versions like scabies and different things. 
that are physical ailments that plague a people. We have more now than ever before. Because you see, when our nation was still intact, morally and spiritually, we were finding cures for, for plagues, like polio. You know what the CDC now says? That's the government agency that monitors the health, physical health of the nation. They said antibiotics are failing. In fact, they picked out one venereal disease, gonorrhea, and said we had, was it three or four antibiotics that were able to treat that? They now all failed but one, and it is showing signs of being ineffective. And they're urging doctors to be careful about its use. Are all these diseases and our inability to fight diseases a reflection of what God said would come upon Israel if they turn their back on him? And then again, he will lend to you, but you will not lend to him. America is in deeper debt than any nation in human history. Trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. And we have borrowed from China and India and other places to a, to a level, a magnitude that is unprecedented. And here is the God of the Bible telling Israel, mm -hmm. that's what happens when you turn your back on me. Where do our economic woes come from? The Bible says, from turning one's back upon God. Founders understood this. Here's the final proclamation at the end of the war. Whereas it hath pleased the supreme ruler of all human events to dispose the hearts of the late belligerent powers to put a period to the infusion of human blood by proclaiming a cessation of all hostilities by sea and land. And these United States are not only happily rescued from the dangers and calamities to which they've been so long exposed, but their freedom, sovereignty, and independence ultimately acknowledged. And whereas in the progress of a contest on which the most essential rights of human nature depended, the interposition of divine providence in our favor hath been most abundantly and most graciously manifested and the citizens of these United States have every reason for praise and gratitude to the God of their salvation. When you read through the rest of that, they give entire credit to God for our independence. They don't attribute it, you know, to the great military skill of our army and our commanding leaders. Above all, he's been pleased to continue to us the light of our blessed gospel and secure to us in the fullest extent the rights of conscience in faith and worship. And he is causing pure religion and virtue to flourish. And we pray to fill the world with his glory. Psalm 72. Here's a proclamation, the final one, that gives complete credit to God for winning the war. Astounding. All of this material is available through Apologetics Press in book and DVD form. We need to teach this to our children. In fact, these proclamations, all 15 of them, ought to be framed and put on the walls in every schoolroom, every courtroom, and every capital building in our country. In our session this afternoon, I hope you will be back. I'm going to get more specific and concrete about what do we do now? You know, okay, you see the way they intended it, but, you know, our circumstances are pretty far afield from that it's hard to find political leaders that show hardly any of these attributes what should we do then I don't claim to be a prophet or to have all the answers but I'm going to give you some very specific concrete things you know the number one thing you need to do is be a New Testament Christian I'm telling you that's it that would solve all of our nation's problems if we get everybody to be New Testament Christians I pretty much solve it. But have hardly any problems. Through faith, repentance, confession, immersion in water for the remission of sins. Isn't that simple? That's how God set it up. And then as Christians, we've got to live faithful. And that, that too is critical. You know, it's easy to look around at the country and say, look how people are acting. 
Well, how are people who claim to be Christians acting? How active are they? You know, have you already made plans for your afternoon to not be here? Okay. With all the kindness I can muster. You're part of the problem. You're part of the problem. Our nation is moving further away from God. Six out of ten Americans don't even bother to go to church. So obviously there are other things in life that are more important to them, more meaningful to them. They feel like they need to be spending their time and money on. If we cannot restore spiritual mindedness to even the people who claim to be Christian, then our nation has no hope. I'm telling you, we're going down the tubes. So it starts with us. Let's decide we're going to be active and faithful, and even if the whole country falls down around us, we're going to be living the Christian life and looking to God for our safety and security. If you need to respond to the gospel invitation, you need to do it now while we stand and sing together.